What up, my trading buddies? Glad to see you after the long weekend. I'm John Zadar. This is On Top and Hot, and we're starting the week off on Tuesday. It's May 28th. Now, you know what we do on this show? We focus in on a hot penny stock. I trade penny stocks every day. I am constantly looking for stocks under five bucks that have heat. Stocks that have potential to make us money, since I got to share a video with you at the end of the day. And I got one for us, but to be completely honest, I didn't choose this stock. This is Barnes & Noble Education, ticker BNED. Every platform I post on, Twitter, Facebook, Google, I am getting requests to look at this ticker. So we're going to look at it. Now, this isn't the first time we've looked at Barnes & Noble. We actually looked at it at my live streaming event on Thursday. I have a live streaming event every Thursday, 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We do this so that you can request stocks for me to cover instead of me just giving you stocks. Well, somebody requested BNED, so we did look at it then. Now, we're going to share it with everybody. Now, it was back around May 20th. Barnes & Noble had some news come out about a company that was going to invest millions of dollars into the company. And that got the chart moving. She's had some ups and downs and she's looking pretty good right now. And it is big news. It's hot news. The company really, really needs this money. As a matter of fact, if they don't get the money, they are up against the wall. And I'm going to share the good and the bad news with you on this company. So Barnes & Noble, she finished the day just a little over 63 cents, and she was up almost 9% today. Now, this is a hot penny stock on the major exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, which comes with benefits. There are no transaction fees up on the major exchange. You get to trade at pre-market, after-market. There's a lot more money on the major exchange, a lot more volume up there, and you know what else? A lot more rules. It's just safer to trade major exchange penny stocks than it is OTC. That's my opinion. So what is Barnes & Noble Education all about? Well, you know what Barnes & Noble is about. You see that store in your mind at the mall or at the plaza. They sell books, all kinds of books. Well, yes, that is the same business, but this is a different division that works with higher education. Barnes & Noble Education is a leading solutions provider for the education industry driving affordability, access, and achievement at over 1,400 academic institutions nationwide and ensuring millions of students are equipped for success in the classroom and beyond. Now, we're going to dive around to a couple of their sites. They've got a few of them. We are at bned.com. We will also be going to barnesandnoblescollege.com. So the company makes revenues in two different ways. They work with the institutions and ultimately the students. With the institutions, they are addressing higher education's most pressing issues with customized retail solutions and a suite of affordable academic services. So the company provides all the places that they can sell the textbooks, brick and mortar businesses as well as online. And they take care of all of that for the company, but not just books, a lot of other things too that we're going to take a look at. Now, I got to admit, when I first looked at this company, first thing that came into my mind is they're in trouble. We are moving into a digital age. And coming through the pandemic of COVID, we learn there's a lot of things we don't have to do in person. We don't have to move to a city where a university or college is so that we can go to the room physically listening to the professor every day. We can do that online. So I'm thinking if they got to keep printing books, paying for all that paper, binding them, mailing them while the whole world's going digital, this company was just going to fade away. But then I read this and it made me think twice. For students, helping students study and learn more effectively with digital, direct-to-student products and services. Ah, maybe they are going to put their publications and textbooks into digital form. Or am I misreading this? Are they just talking about being able to offer the textbooks digitally on platforms online? I wasn't sure, so I kept digging around. Now, they're not real clear about this, but we can pick up pieces of information to see what's going on. Barnes & Noble did a survey of the faculty and the students at these universities and colleges. 
The pandemic's impact on class formats has uncovered a discrepancy in preferences between students and faculty. Nearly half of the students prefer what is called hybrid class format. You have going to the class physically, you have going online, and then you have hybrid. Some of it's online, some of it's with the professors. Well, more than half of the students want the hybrid while more than half of the faculty prefer the old-fashioned way, let's just get you in the class and have me teach you face-to-face. -face. What's most interesting is none of them wanted to go fully remote. Everybody believes in the value of the professors and the teachers. Nobody wants to get rid of them. Now, what's really decent here is that this isn't just a little operation. As I said, they have brick-and-mortar stores. Not little stores, folks. Look at this picture. You get an idea of how big this is? I mean, that is gigantic. Now, I have no idea where this store is. I have no idea how many of these stores they have. But the store doesn't just sell books. They sell anything that the college or university sells. All of their clothing for their sporting events, their hats, their, their sweaters, uh, keychains, whatever it is they sell, they sell it all online as well as in stores. So they've got deals with institutions and ultimately they're making money from the students. And right now they're at over 1,400 colleges and it looks like they could be going digitally. I haven't found enough information here, but that's the way it looks, which would be outstanding. This is what the company needs to do if they want to make more money. Not that they're doing bad now. They're generating a lot of revenues, but it's costing them a lot of money because they got to pay for all the manufacturing of the books. They got to pay for all the supplies, the paper, the binding. They got to pay for shipping these things. So if they could get down to digital, they would eliminate all of that expense and would start making a lot more money. All right, let's go take a look at the relative volume for the company now. All right, over the last 30 days, the company's been doing roughly 25 million shares. Today, she dropped a little bit. She was over 23 million shares. Share structure for Barnes & Noble. Well, that's not too bad now, is it? We got a measly 53 million shares outstanding. Now, they don't tell us what the restricted shares are. That's how many the insiders own. And they don't give us the unrestricted, which is normally where I get my float. Down here, they do give us a float. And I normally don't pay any mind to that because it's normally really old. That's not old. That's April 27th of this year. They say there was 45 million in the float. That may be the case, or it may not. I can't guarantee anything. Market cap for the company, we are currently about $31 million. Take a look at those financials. Well, as I said, the company's generating good revenues. We got to put three zeros behind any of these numbers. So we're looking at billions of dollars, right, for a penny stock. In 2020, they were at $1.8 billion, dropped down to 1.4, 1 1.5 in 21 and 22. And at the end of 2023 fiscal year, which ends in April for them, they were at $1.5 billion. But that cost them $1.2 billion. So they got to keep $350 million, which is good. Don't get me wrong. They're making strong revenues. They're bringing home strong profits. But if they went digitally, they'd be making a lot more profit. What's their quarterlies look like? Ooh, we've got some ups and downs, right? Year ago, we were at 438 million. We just ended the last quarter at 456 million. In between, we dropped all the way down to 240 to 260 million and jumped up to 610 million. Let's take a look at that balance sheet for the company. Wow, for all that money and that's all they got in the bank? Eight million dollars, really? Total assets, got a lot of assets, $1.1 billion, and they got a lot of liabilities. Not as much though, just a little over a billion. So we've actually got positive stockholder equity in this company, just over $97 million. So we're not holding a bag with this company. Disclosures for ticker BNED, right. I do have some disclosures here I wanna share with you. But before we dive into those disclosures, they're not going to make much sense unless you see the news first. Now, I told you that the company, I can see I'm going to lose my highlights here. That's okay. I've highlighted it three times. I know exactly what to read. 
So they had this deal come out somewhere around May 20th, and they've spoke about it a couple of times, and the numbers are fluctuating, they're changing a little bit, but the deal is still hot, there's a lot of money on the table, and this looks to be where we're settled right now. Barnes & Noble is to receive $95 million of new capital, $50 million in new equity investment, and $45 million in fully backstopped equity rights offerings. Now, rights offerings, a lot of people aren't familiar with rights. I am vaguely familiar with them. Rights are a lot like warrants. Warrants and rights, think of them both as coupons. Warrants are coupons that you're going to use way down the road. A couple years down the road, it guarantees you the right, the option to buy a share at a discounted price if you choose to. Rights give you the same option except in the next few months, you get to buy a share at a discounted price. And they want to put $45 million of those on the market, which means when they're cashed in, people are going to be buying shares for a lot cheaper than they really are on the market. Along with this deal, the way they're working it, they're going to end up saving, eliminating an additional $34 million worth of debt. So there's a lot going on here. Lots of money coming in and they're going to save a lot of money. It is critical to them that they get it. And that's where we jump into the, uh, the filings. I've got three of them I want to share with you here. I don't know what date they came out. It really doesn't matter because they're all talking about the same thing. They need for us, the shareholders, to pass this with a shareholder vote on June 5th. The company states, we would like to speak with you regarding your vote at the important special meeting of stockholders of Barnes & Noble Education to be held June 5, 2024. Your vote today could impact the future value of your investment. If the core proposals are not approved, we expect that we will likely need to file for bankruptcy protection. You've been warned. You're going to be warned again. This one came out May 23rd. We recently sent you to proxy materials in connection with the special meeting of stockholders. This meeting and your vote are vital to the ongoing survival of your company. If the core proposals are not approved, we expect that we will likely need to file for bankruptcy protection. So it's an absolute, folks. You better vote. If you own this stock, you better vote yes, or you know what's going to happen. They're going to go into bankruptcy, and that's going to bring the price way, way down. But wait, there's more information. They just had another filing come out. Ah, good thing I read this. This is at the very bottom. These are details about this deal. Well, here at the very bottom, they tell us, once the transaction contemplated by the purchase agreement, including the reverse split, have been completed, there will be approximately 26.3 million shares of common stock issued and outstanding. There's the point. There's a reverse stock split in all of this as well. So what was the share count on the company? Wasn't it about 53 million? 53. So we have a two to one reverse stock split. They're going to cut it in half. So there, we need to vote so that they can get their $95 million, 50 million in new capital investment, 45 million from rights they're going to put on the market, and an additional 35 million that they're going to save from debt if they get this all taken care of. Then there's going to be a reverse split, taking away half of our shares and doubling the price. I'm not quite sure from what price, but it's going to be over a dollar. And being on the major exchange, you've got to have your price over a dollar. If you're under a dollar for too long, they will kick you off the major exchange down to the OTC. Now, it's not like they do it automatically. You get a warning. They'll tell you, and they say you got six months to get that price up over a dollar. But why do they tell the, the management? It's not up to them. It's up to us, the investors. We have to bid the price and close over a dollar, 10 consecutive days, and then the company is out of hot water. So this is going to get the price up over a dollar, and I have not gone through all the filings. I don't know if the NASDAQ has reached out to them or the New York Stock Exchange and warned them. I have no idea. 
But if we do approve this, and we really need to, they're going to get the money. They're going to do the reverse stock split. They're going to be over a dollar. Hopefully, that's going to be good. Now, right now, the chart is looking pretty decent. I saw it earlier today. She looked like she was setting up for a breakout, and she was. <laughs> she started to run before I could even get to you folks, and I haven't looked at it since around 2 o'clock. So let's go look at this chart together and see what she looks like now. It's charting time. My favorite part of due diligence. We are looking at ticker BNED. This is Barnes & Noble's education. And we're going to be doing our charting on my free trading platform, Thinkorswim. Got this opened up to a one-day, one-year chart. And as you can clearly see, she's been in a downtrend the entire year. We have had some breakouts over the 200, even had a 100% run here, but she always manages to come back down underneath the 200 and continues to fall. Our 52-week high hit in January of this year, $2.26, and our 52-week low hit in May, that was $0.15. Cents. Off of that low, she has gotten through all of her SMAs, broke through that 200, and she's fallen back down right on top of her 9-day SMA which is a good landing. That's a controlled fall. Now, we've had a lot of volume come in since that low bubble. This last week has had more volume than we've seen for an entire year. Our oscillators, PPO is strong, MACD is strong, though it's cooled off just a tad bit. And our RSI was blazing, really had a hard drop, and now she is starting to climb again. So even though it doesn't look super hot, that's not a bad chart. It's coming down to our six-month, four-hour view. Well, we definitely have a downtrend going here. Or do we? Let's take a closer look. What do we got right there, folks? That is a flat 200-day SMA. She was falling, and now she's flat. And where did she break out at, folks? Right at the flat point. And she gave us a warning. She gave us a token sign that she was going to do this right there. This bar right there told you this was going to happen. I call that a directional intentional spike. You can call it whatever you want. <laughs> this is how it works. She's normally underneath a lot of SMAs. She will push the solid bar up close to the 200, then spit a wick out over the 200. The further it goes, the better. The next bar tells the rest of the tale. If this bar does not come down any lower than where the initial surge started, as far as I'm concerned, that's a 98% chance she's going to run. Not immediately, it's just now you watch her because she's looking for an opportunity. What's that opportunity? I just told you. <laughs> it's that flat 200-day SMA, and she helped create that opportunity. By pushing that spike up, she is actually tugging that 200-day SMA up She's making it flat, creating her own passageway to run. And as soon as it went flat, she bounced off of this 50-day SMA at about 25 cents up to $1.35. You're looking at over 500% run right there, folks. Amazing. She then came back down, tried to slow down a little bit on the 20. Couldn't do it exactly on the 20, but she's burning rubber right now, hitting the brakes and turning around. All of our other SMAs, the big boys, the 200 haul on the 50, they're now getting on top of the 200-day SMA, which is where they belong. That is good. Our oscillators, everything is changing right now. It was all falling, and right now it is just at the cusp, the very bottom of the bowl just before it starts to turn up. Everything looks like it's set up for the climb to continue. Taking a look now at our one-hour view. Well, definitely we got a trend change. Our 200-day SMA was falling hard here. Look how many days it was flat. We started to climb a little bit here, a little bump and then a drop, doing nothing for days. Then on the 17th, we had that token sign. She jumped up, came back down, bounced on her 50-day SMA. This is the 21st, and that's when she had her 500% run. Coming back down and curling around, and she is currently sitting on that nine-day SMA above her 200. Now, things don't look perfect here, 
We got our 200 haul over her head. We have the 50 day hitting her in the head. And even our 200 day SMA looks like it's cresting downward right now. But our osculators say she is fighting. You can see everything is right at the cusp of getting over and on top of the line, over and on top of the signal line. And our RSI is actually climbing. Remember, your RSI is the price line. If you were to change all these bars and make it one line, it would look like that line right there, like the flat globe. That's what that is. So it is climbing. The price is climbing right now. Let's come on down to our five-day, five-minute. No, wait a minute. Before we go anywhere, I want to put some perspective on this chart, okay? First thing I want to do, I want to grab my regressive channel. I am going to hit this low bubble here, and I'm going to drag this off to current times right there. So, this gives us an idea of her trend, where she is moving. She is definitely on an uptrend. She broke out of the channel here really hard, came back down and did not even fall to the bottom of the channel here, which is pretty decent. It shows she's still got strength, and she's starting to turn around coming towards the center point of our channel, which is currently at 78 cents. Now keep that number in mind, 78 cents. I'm going to get rid of this drawing and I'm going to now bring up my Fibonacci. The Fibonacci I like to use on strong runs or strong drops. And it's an automatic tool as well. All you got to do is poke the extremities, where it begins and where it ends. Now what I'm particularly looking for is the halfway point, which is right there. This is real important for a lot of reasons. First off, when you have a strong run, expect it to fall. A strange surge is going to have a drop. It's going to pull back. A good surge will not come down any further than 50%. It will keep at least 50% of everything it threw on the table. If it can stay in the positive zone, above the halfway point, which is a perfect algorithm. This is dead center of that run. A perfect center, a perfect average, a perfect algorithm charts love these. So if it can come down and stay in the positive above it, it will normally climb. If it falls into the negative zone below the 50, it will normally fall even deeper until it hits a strong support or an SMA. This one is now starting to turn around and our 50% mark is at, look at that, virtually 78. The same number we had in our channel going up, 78 seems to be a critical point. We need this to get over 78, and we're going to get a lot of extra uh, release so that she can start to move easier. Osculators, we got that crossover on our PPO. Our MACD is just about ready to get on the signal line, and our RSI is climbing. Now let's come on down to that five-day, five-minute. She is all over the place. She was on an uptrend here with that 200, downtrend for the last three days, and what have we got right now, folks? A flat SMA. Look, it did it again. Now, this is where I looked at it, folks. I saw it around this area today, and I said, oh, this looks good. It's got a chart that looks like it's ready to break out. Urgh. She broke out before the day ended. I should have been able to talk to it down here. But when did she do that, folks? Look and look close. There's our 200-day SMA. As soon as it goes flat, that's when you have your rips. This is how you find charts with heat. Look for a price up underneath the 200 with the 200 either just about ready to go flat or it gave you that directional, intentional spike shooting through the 200, coming back down and getting ready to run. That's what we're looking for with a, a chart that has heat. So we had the rip early. She took off here from about 57 cents up to 73 cents. Ah, you're looking at roughly 40, 50% run there. Came back down. She's hanging on underneath our 50-day SMA, pulled away, and is now going sideways. This looks like a dangler. Whenever I see a dangler, I like to go back to the 15-minute. Normally, I find she's sitting on something. Yeah, okay, look. She is actually sitting on the 20-day SMA. Boing, 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 boing. She was on that lots and lots. Then she started to test it. 
She's tested a couple times here after market, and now she's starting to win that test. Our nine-day SMA is pulling up. All of our SMAs on our 15-minute are starting to climb. Oscillators are all in recovery. Far as I can tell, folks, she is just getting ready to start climbing again. And we've got a lot of volatility going on right now with the company. A lot of money sitting on the table that they can only get if we, the shareholders, approve this deal. And we've got till June 5th to do it. After we approve it, there's going to be a reverse stock split. We're going to lose half of our shares and the price is going to double, getting it up over a dollar, getting it out of hot water with the New York Stock Exchange. That's everything in a nutshell, but there's more to know, folks. I like the company for a run. Thanks for asking me to cover it, folks. That's why I like your, your guys' suggestions. You're a community out there. A lot more eyeballs out there than there is in here. So thank you kindly. So do your own due diligence, folks. I've shared enough information with you to get you curious, maybe even excited, but it shouldn't be enough to get you to invest. Your due diligence should do that. Remember, folks. The more you know, the more you're going to grow. See ya.